if I was trying to make up a question for tomorrow and we have gotten to a point now where I don't really have to filter the FRQs from the AP exam from prior AP exams very much. You have a lot of skill sets now. Now I'm not saying you're capable of doing them. I'm just saying you have a lot of skills now. So I want to call your attention to a question. And I believe this question is one that you should have absolutely very little difficulty completing. But I'm saying that knowing that that might not be your experience. And then I want to show you how it would apply to tomorrow's test, to Friday's test. So imagine I have a very light, thin string, meaning the string itself has no mass to it. But I have a ball at the end of mass M, and the string is length L. Now, I'm going to release the ball so that it can swing downwards. to here where it is likely to be moving with some velocity v all right um, i think there's a, a variety of questions that could be asked and when I say variety, there's a lot, but I'll start with what I feel the ones that you are kind of like low hanging fruit. Like, what is the acceleration of the mass when it's first released? That one's like probably going to throw a bunch of you, but it's bonehead easy. The second one is what is the velocity when it reaches the bottom? Not particularly hard but you probably will have to do a little of a soul searching to figure out which property is being kind of targeted here. And then perhaps at the bottom, what is the tension in the string? These seems like very reasonable questions to me and they are things that do not involve this unit at all. So you can't really say I haven't been here for the last two weeks, so I can't do this. And this is all first semester stuff, every bit of it. So can you find those three expressions real quick, or at least some part of them? I'll give you just a moment, because I don't want to spend a lot of time. This isn't what you should expect tomorrow. And not because I feel like that's the amount of time you need for it but I really want to move towards what I want you to see. And this is just to get you thinking about problems. The acceleration was just G. When you release it in this, where it is right there, it's going to experience a tangential acceleration only, and it'll be straight down. So that one's pretty, pretty straightforward. And if you don't, I mean, if you just look at the net force on it, it's going to be equal to MA and the only force acting on it at this instant when it's first released is weight, which is straight down. So you sub in mg and you get mg equals ma, so a equals g. You'll understand why I asked that question in a moment, but that's where I wanted to start. Let's see, now the velocity at the bottom, conservation of energy. I say that the object had a clear change of height. So it started from rest at a place that is a distance L above its lowest point. So the amount of potential energy is MGL. At the bottom, it has converted this potential energy into kinetic energy. So that's going to be equal to one half MV squared. It acts like an object that's been dropped. This should not be a surprise either. We've been talking about this all year. Square root of two GL. That's how fast it's going at the bottom. Question about that? All right. At the bottom, uh, the object is experiencing two forces. There's a force upwards, tension, and a force downwards, mg. But the object is clearly in circular motion. So net force 
equals M A C. So I'm expecting you to have T minus M G equals M V squared over L. Substitution. So we get T minus MG equals M 2GL over L. Bringing us to the end here where T equals 3MG. So um, this problem is in your notes, or it should be, um, but it's from months ago. Sometime in December, we probably would have done a question like this. I think it's not terribly uh, much to ask. That's going to set us up for what I think you should be able to do now. And trust me when I say what I'm about to put up here, I think has a much higher expectation. But it's the same exact question. Now, there's two ways I could go about transitioning to this next question. And I've decided that the way I'm going to transition is just to bring up the next question. I have a uniform bar that is held in place at a pivot point here and is free to swing downwards. So it's going to be released. Let's say that there's a, maybe a cable holding it here and I'm about to cut the cable. The instant the cable is cut, what is the angular acceleration of the rod? If the rod swings downwards here, What is the angular velocity of the rod? Or B number two, what is the velocity of the end? They're related questions. And question number three, What force is provided by the pivot when the rod is at the bottom? Three questions. This is the same exact set of questions as you've just done. But clearly, this is a more difficult question. Let's say the rod has mass m and length l. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, to, to fool you. I don't think that everybody can do this question. I believe that everybody should be able to do this question. If you couldn't, you're behind. But this question, I'm not going to fool you. I think that we've never done anything like this. Although every piece of information that you need has been presented, I think this problem is a different kind of problem. I want to show you, though, that you have the tool set to do this. Okay. So I would let you guys run off with it, but I think that it would be best if perhaps we kind of look through this one together. And I want to see how the homework we've done has set you up to be able to do this question. First, let's talk about question A. When the rod is first released from rest, there are two forces acting on the rod. There's the upward force on the pivot point. Right, the thing that's holding it. 
and then there's a downward force of weight at the center of mass. Any question about those two forces? Any surprises? If the pivot point is here, do either of these forces cause a torque? One of them does. The force here does not cause a torque. It acts at the pivot point, so the torque arm is zero. But the force here does cause a torque. It acts away from the pivot point. So there's a torque arm of L over two. So we can compute an expression for the torque. Torques are torque arm length times force times the sine of the angle between them. So I think we have torque arm length, L over two, force MG, and it's the sine of 90. So I can stop there. This is the torque acting on the rod just as it's released. That's not what you were asked. You were asked for the acceleration of the rod just as it was released. And that's a different question. So if I want to find the acceleration of the rod just as it was released, I have to set this equal to I alpha. So clearly to get alpha, I need to know what I is for the rod. This is a rod spun about its end. So the moment of inertia is well known. And one of the ones I encourage you to memorize. Is it possible to solve this for alpha? I believe it is. I'll point out that the M's cancel. One of the L's cancels. And we get a value for alpha that's equal to uh, 3G over 2L. Now, um, we haven't done that problem before. Did it require a lot of you? It did require the definition of the of torque, and it did require the moment of inertia, and you had to put those pieces together. But you haven't done it before, so I, I think this is, you know, I think this can be challenging. Uh, something that's interesting here, I find it interesting, so I want you to find it interesting. Is there any point on the meter stick that's accelerating at G? It's not obvious, but the entire meter stick accelerates downwards. In fact, you know, we've got one right here. If this is a meter stick, then when you release it from sideways, you know, it's gonna do something like that, but is there a point on the meter stick that's accelerating at G? So to figure that out, the meter stick's length L. So I want to know if there's any point that equals G, the linear acceleration. So this is just an aside question, but I'm looking at this going, well, I can put this in for the angular acceleration and see if there is an R where the acceleration would be equal to G. So as an aside goes, G's cancel and it looks like at two thirds L that point on the meter stick, 67 centimeters, is accelerating at G. 
kind of funny is everything after that is accelerating faster than G. I say funny because um, sometimes people don't anticipate that when they make things and they break because of it. Because you're asking something to accelerate faster than gravity is causing it to. They also bend and flex because of it. So if you've ever seen a crane fall, you'll notice that it starts to bend and flex as it falls because it's being asked to accelerate faster than G. But that's a, that's a lot. I probably wouldn't ask that on a test. But asking the acceleration, I um, have absolutely no problem asking for the acceleration. <laughs> Jokers out there. So, uh, moving on, I want you to figure out how fast it's going when it reaches the bottom. Do you see the similarity in that question to the question we've already done? Get all the stuff out of the way. Put that back. Now, this part, um, I think this takes a, a bit of a leap of logic. The center of mass is here. The center of mass is going to swing down to here. Is there a change in height of the object? I mean, it's part of it, yes. Part of it, no, right? In this problem, without this piece of context, I'm not sure you would have gotten it. The center of mass changes height. So this is something I don't, I'm not sure that you would have known unless you read the chapter. But the center of mass changes height, which means the object has gravitational potential energy due to the center of mass being lifted above the lowest point the center of mass goes to. I don't think I could have expected that from you. However, this directly equals one half I omega squared. That I can expect from you. We talked about rotational kinetic energy. And I expect that you guys can use this. Once you know that, though, solving for omega is just algebra you will have to sub in one third I L, not I, I'm saying one third M L squared before you do it. I have nothing special here, but you need this to do the next part. So we might as well. Um, I can cancel out the one halves. I can cancel out one of the L's. I can cancel out the M. And I see 3G over L equals omega squared. I'm going to check the units on that real quick. And I have a G is meters per second squared. L is in meters. So this is in per second squared. So without a unit, that's assumed to be radians. Square root of that will be radians per second. All right. Um, the last part, tough question. How much force does the pin pull on the rod as it rotates through the bottom? Uh, we just did it, though. That force has to be equal to M either V squared over R or M omega squared times R. I'd probably use the omega squared version. Does that seem appropriate? It seems appropriate to me. But there's a, there's a bit of a problem here. You'll see it in a minute. Um, the two forces, 
I've got like an upward tension acting on the prong and I've got a downwards weight. That's still true. There's that force downwards right here. MG acting at the center of mass. And the point right here has to be pulling upwards. The hard part is, um, what's R? That's a hard question. I'm not sure what you would put in there. I think a lot of you would put L, but it's where the center of mass is. So it'd be L over two. But the rest of the problem, drop in my pieces. So T minus MG equals M times three G over L times L over two. Um, the L's cancel out and you're gonna have three halves MG plus MG. So that's gonna be five halves MG. It's slightly less than the last question. And that's because the mass isn't as far away. It's not spinning as fast. And that's why the tension's a little less if you do it this way. There's a lot in this question, but surprisingly, most of the rotational part is the additional stuff. The rest of it, what you had to do is all stuff we've already done. I'm bringing this problem up because this is where what you've done in class actually is going to be reflected on FRQs. This is how this stuff shows up on FRQs. So when we've talked about rotational motion and kinematics, all that, it's to apply it directly to problems we've already done. But I think this is, I think this is hard. I think it requires a lot of judgment call that you didn't have to make before. And some of you found this problem hard back when we did it. I knew this is what was coming. Yes, ma'am. There's two different formulations for centripetal acceleration, one in terms of the rotational speed of the object, one in terms of the linear speed of a point. Um, the only thing that's different between them is this substitution has been used to go from the linear speed to the angular speed. And I believe both of these are actually on your, on your equation sheet. I'm not sure. It used to be. I assume it still is. They are? All right. So at this point, though, I will open up for you guys to ask me any question you want on the homework and the homework was simpler than this. So, and I recognize that. So, let me. So, again, I see three torques. This is question number 21. Uh, the next torque that I think is obvious is the 10 kilogram mass, is applying a torque to the system. Um, that torque is being applied, if I use my three finger rule, uh, pointer finger weight down, pointer finger to the side, so my thumb goes into the board, so it's causing a rotation that's into the board. So I'm going to make out of the board positive, and I'm going to make into the board negative. So my, my 10 kilogram box is going to have a negative torque. It has a torque arm length of 0 0.0225. Not 0 0.0225, is it? So, sorry. A little overzealous with the dividing. 0 0.225. Um, it's going to have a force of 100 newtons, and it too acts as a sine of 90 degrees. But what you might not be thinking about is there is a third torque, and that is the disc itself. The disc itself has a mass of five kilograms. 
assuming that the disc's weight acts at its center, then it must be pulling down at the center of mass of the disc. That also appears to be a negative torque as it acts into the board. Um, that's going to be a torque arm length of 0 0.075 and a force of 50 sine 90 degrees. This will be the net torque on the system, which I don't believe is going to be balanced. I think it's going to be unbalanced. Um, it would be your responsibility to figure out in what direction it is unbalanced and in what direction the system rotates. But with that 10 kilogram sitting so far away, pretty sure it's going to rotate in the negative direction. That's my, um, that's my guess. I don't actually know the answer. Um, I would like you guys to not consider the answer so much. The answer at this point is arithmetic. Would you agree? So you can calculate numbers. Um, there is absolutely no reason why you couldn't be asked to figure out the acceleration of the disc when the masses are released. This is an unbalanced torque. It's going to cause the system to accelerate. The problem is you don't have the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is not of a disc through its center. It's through a disc offset away from its center you would have to use the parallel axis theorem to figure out the new moment of inertia. And then you could figure out alpha. That's not asked in here. That would be asking, I think, a lot for our first test on this. But I think that that's within the purview of our course. So maybe the second test on this but maybe not the first. You follow me? Yeah. Now, if these two masses were hung off the middle of this object, I would have less compunction to ask about the acceleration because then you would just plug in one half MR squared for your moment of inertia. I will not have you memorize any moments of inertia for this test. I could have you prove them, but I'll not have you memorize them. And my intent on our first test is not to have you do the calculus to prove a moment of inertia. You will not be asked to do that. You could be asked to use the parallel axis theorem, or you could be asked to use the point mass formula. If you're asked to use the point mass formula, you should expect that on, on uh, multiple choice. Okay. Next question. Yes, ma'am. We're kind of set up so that all three of these, you know, these two dots lie along a diameter. And that diameter is horizontal at the start of the problem. So the force is going to act perpendicular to that diameter. And that's why I would choose 90 degrees for that. Um, just so you guys know, no matter what, a rope will come off a pulley 90 degrees. It'll always be a tangent. You can't have a rope come off a pulley at an angle that is not tangent to the pulley because it'll just unwrap or wrap around the pulley until it's tangent. So when using pulleys, your angles are always going to be 90 degrees for stuff like that. Now, if this had begun to rotate, the center of mass would no longer be level with the, the pivot point, then it wouldn't be 90 degrees any longer. It's only like this while it's lined up, so right when I release it. All right, other questions on the homework? Yes, ma'am. Number 17, where will you can find it? Um... There you go. That's it. Parallel axis theorem. And again, this is uh, number 17B. I didn't record this, so I'm just kind of leaving it up here for a few seconds. People can see what to do for the answer. But is there another one you guys want to see? Yes, ma'am. Number what? Three. A ceiling fan with 80 centimeter diameter blades is turning at 60 RPM. Suppose the fan coasts to a stop 25 seconds after being turned off. What is the speed of the tip of a blade 10 seconds after the fan is turned off? And to how many revolutions does the fan turn while stopping? Uh, question B is actually easier to do with the information that is given. Well, we're told that the, uh, 
that our initial velocity is 60 RPM. And for question B, our final velocity is zero. And time is 25 seconds. We're looking for delta theta. So um, I'm not gonna do the whole problem. It's motion problems and they're just not interesting enough for me to, to do. I don't mean that as an insult. I just mean that it's arithmetic. Once you know what relationship to use, it becomes plug and chug. Uh, you will have to convert this to radians per second. Uh, to, to, well, no, it wants rotations. How many rotations it makes when stopping. So um, you have to convert that to RPS. So that's not too hard. Um, if it makes 60 revolutions per minute, that means it's making one per second. So plug all that in, that'll give you delta theta in rotations. So that's question B. Question A asks, what is the speed of the tip of a blade 10 seconds after the fan is turned off? Um, we're only gonna be able to do that question if we know more information. And the information we're gonna need is perhaps the angular acceleration. So, because we don't have a, a we don't have enough motion variable, we know that the initial velocity is sixty and the time is ten seconds. We need. Oh, I've been using the linear one. These should all be angular. Sorry, I got all on my high horse and didn't put the fancy Ws. There. So we need the angular speed after ten seconds. At the start of the problem, we don't have enough information to do that. It would make best to find alpha because we know that the acceleration is probably the same between part A and part B. So I would use this information to find alpha. Um, you're eventually going to have to get this in radians either way. So I would convert this to radians now. So this is 2 pi uh, radians per second or 6.28 radians per second. And I would use that to figure out what alpha is in radians per second squared. Um, bypassing this, that's going to be omega squared minus omega naught squared. Oops, nope, not bypassing that. It's going to be omega squared equals alpha t plus omega naught. That will give you alpha. So alpha is going to be 6.25 uh, minus 0. Nope zero minus 6.25 divided by 25. That becomes the angular acceleration here. You can use that to figure out the angular speed. You're not done yet, but that's most of the heavy lifting. If you want the answer, it's V equals omega R to find the speed of the tip of the blade 10 seconds after it's been shut off. Your test is not going to concentrate on this stuff. You're going to see this stuff in the multiple choice. But it's going to be there. So if you want to get all the multiple choices right, you'll need to be able to do these kind of kinematic questions.